Let's go to Mark chapter 8. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Mark chapter 8. We'll start in verse 11 and uh, read down to verse 21. Ten verses. And uh, before I get there, you see Jesus coming away from the Decapolis, now turning toward Jerusalem. He's going to talk to two different groups of people. One is the Pharisees. That conversation does not go well. From verse 11 to verse 13 is the Pharisees. Verse 14 to verse 21, you see his interaction with his people, with the disciples. It's better, but it's still disappointing. You follow along as I read. Grass with us in the flowers, faith with the word of our God. Stands forever. Stands forever. Let's begin verse 11. <clears throat> the Pharisees came, and they began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, went to the other side. Right into it. Now, now they had forgotten to bring bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them and he said, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember? Now, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Join me as we pray. Father, I pray where eyes have been blinded, you would remove that which covers them. Where ears have been stopped up, God, I pray that you would take out, you would unstop those ears. God, I pray where there has been years of running away, avoiding, ignoring, rejecting. I pray that today, that that rejection would be no more. Amen. That you would save people. Yeah. That you would call people that you would strengthen your church, yes. that you would find us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I spent most all day yesterday in an airport or in an airplane. I flew to Birmingham, Alabama, and then flew back. I went there because our executive pastor, Steve Adams, his sister died this week, and he did the funeral. All day in an airport. Now, I am a Protestant. I do not believe in purgatory, but yesterday got me close. <laughs> Went to Birmingham to be with Steve and his family as he preached the funeral for his sister. She was 57 years old. She was a Christian lady and five years ago found out she had a brain tumor. Three years ago, she got married for the very first time. She spent all her life single up to that point. Her husband had been the same. They were a fine Christian couple that had finally got married, and then this happened. And to hear Steve tell it and listen to the funeral message, my heart was heavy going in. But while I was there, reminded, I met her husband, who was so secure in the gospel, reminded of all the hope you have when you are a Christian. You've seen it on social media, probably saw it on the news. You've seen all of the videos that are coming out of Israel and the war with Hamas there in Gaza. And, and you really, if you're not careful, you, you could develop this sort of hardness and hatred. And how can humans treat another human? B babies. 
You watch that and there you see the depth of depravity. And in the middle of such pain and war and, and the terror, we pray for them. We are reminded of a good God who saves people, who loves you, and are able to draw joy and, and strength and hope from the gospel. This morning we're going to see the gospel. You're going to see Jesus talk to two different groups of people. You're going to see one reject, and you're going to see his people, although dull. You're going to see his affection for his people. And you're going to find out that Jesus, Jesus saves all who come to him. And if you will come to him today, he will save you. Now, it's a fairly, fairly long passage, uh, 11 verses, and it deals with two different groups of people. Jesus speaking to the two different groups of people differently, and this is about how Jesus saves. So let's go and read it and go through and just pick out a couple of things. Then we'll come back and try to make some sort of sermonic application, a couple of three or four points, and see if we can pull the truth out. Join me there in verse 11, <clears throat> right off the bat. The Pharisees came. You know he's in Jewish territory if the Pharisees are there. Two leading groups of Jews. One is called Pharisee. The other, others are Sadducees. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees would have been the closest theologically to where the Jews were. Those that might believe in a Messiah. So they've come to him, but notice their motive in verse 11. They came and started to argue. Your Bible might say discuss, or it might even say dispute. They came with an agenda. You can't come to Jesus with an agenda. They came with an agenda and they were going to argue with him. In fact, there's a little, little more. Mark tells us a little more. They came to argue and verse 11, they were seeking a sign. Now my first thought is, where have you been? I mean, I mean, demons are cast out, blindness is taken away, people that are deaf and mute, I mean, he's healing them, he's provided all this food, and they want a sign. They say, well, we want a sign from heaven. Yeah. Is what the text says. And you wonder, what is it going to take? How hard, does a, how hard does a heart have to be? <clears throat> they wanted a sign from heaven, but notice why they wanted a sign from heaven. You see the word in verse 11? They wanted that sign to test him. That ought to ring a bell in your mind. Mark is doing this on purpose, I think. He uses the exact same word that Mark used to describe what Satan did when Satan went to Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him. And I think what Mark is doing is saying, those Pharisees are a bunch of devils. They just want to, they just want to test him. Not Jesus, though. Look at his... Look his Look at his reaction, verse, verse 12. And the text says that Jesus, when he dealt with them, after hearing what they said, he sighed deeply in his spirit. You'll never see that again. It's a good place to underline. He sighed deeply in his spirit. Chapter 7, we saw him sigh. This is something different. This is, this is even intensified. Mark uses different language, a word he doesn't use anywhere else. He sighed deeply in his spirit. It's, it's interesting to me how Jesus responds to his enemies. It's not like I respond. I've seen the atrocities, what's going on with Hamas, the terrible things that they, do, that they have done, and there is some satisfaction seeing Israel drop bombs and think how they're destroyed. It's not... Jesus sees these people that hate him, and he sighs. There's anger, but there's, there's, there's feeling. Don't ever think that God hates you. Don't ever think you're so far, even when you've been an enemy, even, even, even if you've come with an agenda to debate. Here is Jesus and sighs deeply in his spirit, even to the Pharisees. He asks a question, why does, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, that's the second time he's used that phrase, truly, truly, is, is how it's written in Greek. He'll start using it now because he's teaching. Any time you see truly, truly, it's going to be something really Really good. And he says, truly I say to you, there's no sign I'm going to give you. You got two people st sitting at a, an accident 
One sees it one way, one another, and they have diff different perspectives. Matthew was there, or at least his source was there, saw what happened. Mark tells us, he said, there's no sign for this generation. Matthew expands it, Matthew 16, you can, you can pick it up. And, and Matthew tells us, Jesus said, there's no, no sign for this generation except the sign of Jonah. That's the sign you're going to get. Jonah, thrown into the belly of a great fish for three days, vomited back out. That's the sign you're going to get. We'll talk about that in a minute. Verse 13, after saying that, we find out that Mark gives us a judgment passage. Here is judgment in verse 13. It feels like judgment, and he left them. Pharisees have come with that sort of attitude. You've come with an agenda. You've come to argue. You're asking things that are not rational, and the text says he's had enough. Don't you ever wonder how, when is the, where's the point? I mean, it, he, this is consigning them to hell. He left them, got in the boat, went away. That's what verse 20, that's what verse 13 says. So that's one, that's one dealing. That's Jesus with the Pharisees. Now take the camera and turn it over to him in the boat. Because it picks up pretty quickly in verse 14. Now they had forgotten. They've forgotten to bring bread. Now tell me, how could you forget bread? I mean, 5,000 people, you got 12 baskets full, toting that bread around. 7,000 or, or 4,000 people, you got seven big hampers full. You've had bread. All you can come up with, verse 14, is one loaf? Somebody's job, there are 12 of them, somebody's job to get the bread. Everybody had some sign. Might have forgot to get the bread. Mark says they had one loaf. Some people think that Mark is talking about Jesus as the bread of life, that they've, they've got the one thing they need. I don't know if that is true or not, but it's interesting. He says they had one loaf. Verse 15, as they're talking about it, verse 15, he cautioned them. Watch out. He hears them talking about bread. Verse 15, watch out. Beware of the leaven, that's yeast. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Matthew 16, he includes the Sadducees. Beware of the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Beware of the yeast of Herod. I don't know much about yeast. I like a yeast roll. To find out what does yeast do. I, you know, some of you make bread with uh, some sort of starter kit that's under the cabinet and it's like poison or something and somehow you make bread out of it. Yeast just a little bit that goes into the flour and it makes it do all kind of beautiful things. It's just a little bit. Jesus says it doesn't take but a little bit. Beware of that. And so, verse 16, they started discussing with one another. Oh, the, oh, okay, now Jesus is onto it. He's doing this as a metaphor to tell us we don't have bread. So they're talking and they discuss with one another the fact that they don't have any bread. Jesus hearing this, these guys are so dull. So there's this barrage of questions in verse 17. There are nine of them. He just fires them off didactically. They're questions. Verse 17, Jesus, aware of this, he said to them, why? Why are you discussing the fact that you don't have any bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not yet understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Here? Don't you remember? And then he brings them. Verse 19, 20, 21 is life experience. All of those were questions. Now he brings them, you've walked through this with me. Makes them say it. Verse 19. <clears throat> when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they told him 12. And for the 7,000, uh, for the seven. 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Seven. Don't you understand? What do we do with this? What do we do? Let's talk about how Jesus saves. Let's just, let's, let's use that as the lens to look at this. How does Jesus save? I'll give you a couple of things. Here's the first one. Number one. Jesus saves on his own terms. Careful how you understand Christianity. 
Jesus saves on His terms, not ours. Please don't say God accepts me the way I am. He does not. God rejects you the way you are. Rejection. That's the problem. Where God condemns you the way you are. If that were not the case, we wouldn't need the gospel. It would be universalism. God rejects us because we are living in sin outside of the grace of God found in Jesus. There, there are terms. Let me show you where I get that. He doesn't argue. Verse 11 says he doesn't argue. They show up and they want to fight. The Pharisees came and they started to argue, to discuss. Let's have a debate. This is your truth. Here's my truth. There's no debating. There's no negotiation. There's not any contract where you make a deal with God. It's his terms, you see. He doesn't throw his pearls before swine. He offers the free gift of life in Jesus, but it comes on his terms. He doesn't argue. He doesn't perform. Verse 11 tells us that they were seeking from him a sign from heaven. Do something. This seems ludicrous to me. I mentioned that earlier. After all he's done, we're talking about two years of ministry. We don't have all of the miracles recorded. John says, if I were to record everything, we'd fill up the world that couldn't hold the books. So they've seen that. And Jesus says, that's not what I do. I don't step and fetch for you. You want me to do a miracle at your bidding. That is, he does not perform. Jesus knew they wanted a show. He, Jesus did not do miracles to dazzle a crowd. Jesus did not do miracles to get people to send him money. Jesus did not do miracles and promise if you would send money, he would send you a prayer cloth that's going to heal you. He did not do that. Jesus did miracles by way of mercy to help people and to show his authority as the Son of God. The miracles were there for mercy and to show the authority as the Son of God. Some of the, some of the charlatan fake, so-called faith healers of the day. If, if you have the gift of healing, go to the hospital and shut it down. If they can't accept, if, they can't, if the Pharisees can't accept what they've already seen and heard from Jesus, then you've missed your opportunity. He, he saves on his own terms. He doesn't argue and he doesn't perform. Look, he doesn't yield. He doesn't, look, verse 11. I mean, read verse 11 at the end of verse 11. <clears throat> the text says that uh, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him. They were seeking from him a sign from heaven. They did that to test him. It's the exact same word that Mark uses to talk about what Satan did to tempt Jesus. It's this, this is an insult. They are there to insult him. And Mark puts them in league with the devil. This is a terrible confrontation. Jesus doesn't argue. He doesn't perform. He doesn't yield. Instead, what does Jesus do? He offers an exchange. Because you are under condemnation from God and he doesn't accept you the way you are, what does he offer? His perfect life. He, he doesn't accept you. He accepts one. He accepts Jesus. And any person who is in Jesus, that's how you're accepted by God. He offers you not just his life. He offers you his death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is Death, that God will judge by way of death. Jesus stands in the way. It's why he had to be a man, so that he would die in the place of men and women. He offers you his death for your life. He offers his glory to take away our sin. Jesus saves, but he saves on his own terms. Let me give you something else to consider. Number two, Jesus saves with passion, with feeling, with passion. I'm glad if you like theology. I love theology. Dr. Jimmy Quisenberry uh, mentioned a book to me the other day. 
about all of the creeds and confessions uh, in Christendom from the Apostles' Creed all the way up to Westminster Confession of Faith. And I've, I've been on a plane reading those. I, I, mean, I like all those good things to read. You ought to know what it is you believe. But please don't divorce theology from the passion and love of God. There is real affection here. Several things to note right here in verse 12. The text says that after this conversation, this conversation, verse, verse 12 says that he sighed deeply in his spirit. Nowhere else in the New Testament. Sighed deeply in his, this is intensified. He felt it. He looked at the Pharisees. They're hard hearts. They've had all the training and they're not getting it. He didn't hate them. He felt it. Please don't think God hates you. Even if you debate, even if you reject, that's, that's not what the New Testament bears out. The New Testament bears out that he sighed deeply in his spirit. Gives him no pleasure to know that the Pharisees are rejecting him and if they keep it up, they will go to hell. Do you remember him? Matthew 23, Jesus tops the hill and there he sees Jerusalem and says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who sin it. How often I wanted to gather you, your children, gather them together like a, a hen does her brood. But you are unwilling. I mean, the, the, the text here bears out that the, the Pharisees, they had an agenda. They were not willing to yield to Christ. And yet he loved them. Please don't think that God takes any pleasure sending people to hell. That is not the case. The Bible teaches, Ezekiel 33, God says, I, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I have pleasure if the wicked will turn. Turn from the way you're living and turn to Christ. Turn back, God says. Jesus saves with, with passion. Something else there in verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, or truly, truly, for the second time, verse 12, verse 12, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So that's how Mark described it. Matthew tells us in Matthew 16, Jesus said, No sign is given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. And Jesus will say, just like Jonah spent three days in the belly of a well, or a great fish, so the Son of Man. No sign but Jonah. And out of that great fish, Jonah came just like that, the Son of Man. What does he say? There's not a sign you need. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the sign. The gospel. In fact, here's a good place to stop and give it explicitly so that you understand what we believe when we talk about the gospel. When I say gospel, this is what I mean. That God created you in his image. The image of God in you has been disfigured by your sin. You are guilty before God as a sinner. Because God is just, he will punish sin. And if you stay like you are without Christ and you live and run from God and reject the gospel, there comes a day when you then must pay for your sin. You will be judged by God who will then send you to an eternal hell. That's a bad, terrible news. But God is a passionate, loving God. God in His goodness has given us the gospel, which means Jesus Christ lived perfectly as a human. Fully human, fully, fully God. Had to be human to save humans. So He lived perfectly in a way we can't. And why the cross? At the cross, God the Father took His Son in your place. The cross is a place of judgment. And He punished His Son. All of the wrath, all of the punishment went on Jesus. He accepted that. That means that that sentence has been delivered and carried out. It no longer applies. Not only that, because He is loving and kind and can, doesn't just take us as blank, he covers us in the righteousness. Remember, Jesus lived perfectly. We get that to our account. So that if you are in Christ, you said God accepts me like I am. He accepts you in Christ, the perfect life of Jesus. And the gospel says there's no work you can do. There's nothing you can, 
no religion you can practice. There's no many times you can come to church that's going to make you good. What makes you good is being in Christ. It's the grace of God in Christ. And if you'll turn from your sin and by faith believe in Jesus, the Bible teaches you are saved. You see, He saves on His terms. Jesus saves with passion. Let me give you a, a third thing. Number three, He saves through judgment. Through judgment. Verse 12 and 13 has uh, the feel of, of judgment. It's good for us to remember that there is genuine judgment, that the wages of sin is death. I was at the funeral home yesterday in uh, Birmingham. I got there early because, anyway, I got there early, about an hour early. Nobody's there. And so I'm wandering around the funeral home, looking in rooms, a couple of them I wish I had not looked in. And so I started talking to the undertaker, and he told me um, that, that there, a lot of churches are not having funerals in their sanctuaries anymore because they don't want of uh, the sanctuary associated with death for their members. They want them only to, to have life when they come to church. I said, man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> he said, you're a pastor. You really think that? I said, oh, yeah, that's dumb. I said, that, that's not Christian. Cr Christianity tells us, yeah, we live, and the wages of sin is death, and it's good for us to, to see that and be reminded of that. But, but that's not the end. That God in His goodness, the promise of the gospel, is that He raises us from the dead. That's why we do what we do. A, a funeral is a genuinely Christian practice. He said, I never thought about it like that. I said, you an undertaker? You hadn't thought about it like that? <laughs> Just, I mean... Part of, of us being humans is that we will die. That death is a reminder of our sin. And the Christian hope is that what reminds us that our sin is paid for is resurrection. The Bible teaches he saves through, through judgment. Verse 12 and 13 feels like judgment to me. Verse 13, after they're having this conversation, you see it. I need to go quickly. Verse 13, after they have this conversation... The text says he left them. That, that, has a, that has the real Ichabod. The glory is left. That has the real uh, uh, Romans 1, This has a God gave them over to their sin. Left. This is a reminder. Verse 13 is a reminder that, that God will allow you to reject him. And that rejection ends in judgment. It's a terrible thing. If those Pharisees didn't repent from there, then they went to hell. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that, but let me run through the last little bit. <clears throat> Let's spend the rest of our time together. How does Jesus deal with his disciples? Number four, he saves his people. He saves them. Verse 14 all the way to 21. He's... And just a couple of things. If he saves us, it doesn't automatically make us theologically smart. We know everything. These guys are boneheads. I mean, honestly, you're, gonna, I mean, you're like, where have you guys been? You see, let me just show you a couple of things. Here, we need, what do we need? We need sharpening. We need sharpening. We need to be sharpened. The Bible says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Why do we need sharpening? Verse 14 tells us, they had forgotten to bring bread. All they've been hearing about for the last couple of weeks is bread. And they forgot bread. Mark says, I feel like he put, it, put this in there. There's one loaf there. They've got a loaf. That's the bread of life. The truth of the matter is that God has given us the church, one another, to sharpen. That's what the Bible says, iron, iron sharpens iron. We need sharpening. Let me tell you what else we need. We need warning. So they're having this conversation, verse 14, they've forgotten bread. Verse 15, Jesus gives them in another direction. He cautioned them. This is the warning. He cautioned them. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod or the Herodians. If you read Matthew 16, Mark, Matthew tells us he added another one, the Sadducees. So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, beware of the leaven of Herod, beware of the yeast or the leaven of the Sadducees. 
A little bit of yeast, the Bible says, works through the entire loaf. Every single time except two. Two times the Bible has yeast as something pretty good. Every other time it's used metaphorically to symbolize evil. And it's always said that just a little bit affects the whole loaf. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, legalism, lack of grace. Beware of the religiosity that doesn't have mercy. Beware of having a little bit of that. It'll, it'll affect everything. Beware of the, the Sadducees that didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in, in the movement of the Spirit of God. Beware of having a little bit of that. It'll affect the entire church. Beware of, of Herod. Remember, Herod had John the Baptist killed because uh, his stepdaughter did a little dance in front of him, and he's just sort of a weird, dirty old man. And, and Jesus says, you beware of having just a little bit of... Care for how you talk about sexuality and the culture we live in that starts to seep into the church. It affects the whole loaf. We need warning. This insidious spread of things that will affect the purity of our faith. Just a little bit of that creates a rot. What else do we need? <clears throat> we need teaching. Teaching. Verse 17 and 18, they're didactically stacked questions. It just runs through them. They're rhetorical questions. They're designed to teach. So he's just bringing it back up to them. You see the questions. <clears throat> Why are you discussing the fact that we have no bread? It's a rhetorical question, obviously. Do you not yet perceive? Don't you understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and not see it, ears and don't hear? Don't you remember? We, we need reminding. Don't we? That's why I say the gospel every single Sunday. We need to be reminded. We need to talk about that. Why do we have the Lord's Supper? We need to be reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus. When we do baptism. Why do we do that? It's, we're fulfilling a commandment and we are being reminded of the death, burial, resurrection, and new life. We need to be reminded. Jesus says, remember that. You know what else? I, verse 19, 20, and 21. <clears throat> I won't spend much time. But the way it's structured is Jesus asked the questions, and now we're getting an answer. It had nine questions before, no answer. Here, he takes them back to an event and makes them relive it with him. Let me show you what I mean. <clears throat> when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they remembered. They said, well, we took up 12. Everybody had lunch that day. And what about the seven for the 4,000? How many baskets? Remember the big hampers? How many of those big hampers did you drag around and fill up? Seven. He took them back to what he had done and made them confess it. Jesus, Jesus takes us through all we've experienced so that we might remember his provision. Your life is designed right now. What is going on in your life right now is God bringing you through experiences so you see His provision. You know, you know when maturity comes? Maturity comes through suffering. You don't get mature as a Christian without hurting a little bit. Maturity comes through suffering. You know how humility comes? Humility comes through struggle. If you don't struggle, you're prideful. You think you can do it. You're strong, healthy. Struggle reminds humility. Yeah, perseverance. You know where perseverance comes from? Perseverance comes by faith. Remember what Paul wrote? <clears throat> I'll close it with this. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verses 3, 4, and 5? Paul said, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. You imagine it. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Hope doesn't put us to shame. 
Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus saves all who come to him. He saves you on his terms. You come to him today on his terms. He's the righteous one. You come to him on his terms to see his life, death, and resurrection. He saves through passion. The text says that he looked even at his enemies and sighed deep in his spirit. There's love there, the true love of God for you. He saves through judgment. Don't ever say God is not a judging God. The cross is the symbol of God's judgment on sin and grace to all who will believe. He saves you so that you might become part of his people. Be sharpened in a congregation of people that are sinners saved by grace and turned into saints. This morning I'm going to ask you to come and give your life to Jesus Christ and trust him to take away your sin and bring forgiveness. Trust him that at the cross he will save you. As we close this morning, let me ask you to join me in a moment of prayer before we sing another song. <clears throat> With your heads bowed this morning, if any of you here are aware of your own sinfulness and your need for Christ, when we sing, I'll invite you to come forward. Just right down the front. Our pastors are here. If you want to do that, it's a really good time just to say, I need Jesus. You, you may not even know what to say. Maybe that's, maybe that's uh, makes you feel uncomfortable. Then, then after church, we're going to sing a few more songs. After church, our guys will be out in the lobby. That's a good time to have a conversation. Hey, man, I, I, what the preacher was talking about, I need to get that right. God has spoken to your heart. We invite you to have a conversation. Father, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the grace you give us in Christ. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the call of mission. Thank you that you have loved us in Jesus. Father, I pray that, that your spirit would awaken hearts to trust and believe all that you've done in Jesus. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.